Please welcome the Governor of the Commonwealth, Maura Healy. Hello, Governor Healy. Hey, good morning. Good How afternoon. are you? Good Happy afternoon. New Year. Thank it's you. Afternoon. Whatever and, it is. Uh, Happy New Year. And to you. Yeah. How are you? Did you do anything fun? Uh, great. Uh, no, I mean, fun. It was fun to just uh, not, not leave the house, work from home for a couple of days. <laughs> Yeah. Good enough answer yeah, for me. That's true. How's that? Right? Yeah. Okay. I, I left all my shopping till uh, what was it? The twenty third. What was that Saturday? Oh my God! Made the most of it. <laughs> Got it sad. all done. If you leave yourself a little time, it it only takes a little time to get Is it. Is that done. true? Well, that's kind of in my life. So. Yeah. I think you can get <laughs> good, good bargains. I'm all too practiced at it. I think you can get good bargains on the twenty third, twenty fourth. If you leave it to the last minute, you can even get cheap poinsettias. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know if it's worth the stress, but it's, it's very yeah. stressful. So let me give the number good. one more time, 877 The lines are full. If you're here, you can go to Hannah and ask a question in person. If you're impatient and don't want to wait till someone hangs up on the phone, you can text at the same number, 877-301-8970. So, Governor Healy, I'm dying to ask you, because we were talking about this with our listeners before you got here. I know you've got to make some uh, uh, budget cuts. You just announced you're going to make a $375 million in budget cuts. And we read the story in the Globe about the salaries up at UMass. And um, it wasn't just UMass, but it was, a lot of it was at UMass, and a lot of it was of uh, state troopers, too. Um, $1.5 million for one of the coaches and all these chancellors, 800000 600000 700000 500000 professors. There were, there were dozens and dozens of people making over three hundred grand, And it just seemed kind of high to me, very high to me for a state school. And I wonder what you thought about it. I don't know what chancellors do. Maybe you do. But there were about six or seven of them that were pulling in, you know, five and six hundred grand. Well, let me say uh, I'm mindful right now in the, uh, the moment that we're in, and there are a lot of people struggling right now with affordability. And it seems like every time you go to the grocery store, no matter what you pull off the shelf is $5. If it's not $5, then it's 4 bucks. So, you know, let me just say that at the outset. It's also why my administration focused so hard on tax cuts, which, you know, are going to deliver real savings to, to folks around the state. When it comes to things like the salary list that you saw the other day, I just want to level set a little bit. Um, you know, first of all, when it comes to coaches' salaries at UMass, the significant portion, it looks like a big number, the significant portion of that is coming from private reve revenue generation at the, at the facility, and, and a lot of it is coming through friends and boosters groups, okay? It's not coming, it's not taxpayer dollars. So dollar. the $1.6 million no, for no, the basketball it coach it is does not, not all... reflect, it does, I talked to UMass, it does not reflect taxpayer dollar, mm -hmm. okay? So I want people to understand that. Um, because you see that number and you're like, whoa, right? But understand that a significant portion of that is not taxpayer dollar. Um, so when it, says, when it says the Massachusetts, I'm sorry to interrupt, but when yeah. it says the Massachusetts state payroll, it's, it, it, that means that the Massachusetts state pay payroll is reimbursed? Because the, the way the Globe wrote it, it was I, the Massachusetts I understand state how it was payroll. Written. I understand how it was written. I'm just telling you what the, what the uh, facts are. And then when it comes to higher ed, I mean, Massachusetts, we're home to the, the first... Uh, college in the country. We're a state that has prided itself on education um, and support for our colleges and universities and to attract and retain the talent to ensure that we are on the forefront of higher education in this country means that we need to make sure that people are compensated and um, that's what you see. And in terms of the number of state troopers, I, I think there were uh, just a couple on that list and look, they, they get that because they're working detail after detail and overtime after overtime and you know, I, I, I stand by those numbers there too. So you know, I'm, um, as governor, very mindful of the fiscal responsibility that I have to taxpayers. It's why I think we took the prudent step that we needed to take in terms of a little bit of right sizing uh, just, just the other day. Um, and it's also important that we make, you know, the, the kind of investments that we need to make. Do you have any regrets? I mean, you mentioned the tax cut. You campaigned on the tax cut. Uh, obviously, you considered it, a, I think, the major accomplishment, if not at least one of them, if not the major accomplishment of your first year. We'll talk about other things in your first year in a few minutes. Do you have any regrets looking back at the size of the tax cut in light of the fact you had to cut almost $400 million from the budget yesterday? Not at all. I mean, the tax cut um, was absolutely, in my view, imperative. It was imperative to make this state more affordable for people. As a result of that tax cut, which a billion dollar tax cut, um, first time in over 20 years we've seen a tax cut, um, let me tell you what it's gonna do. I mean, this spring, seniors are gonna see $2,400 off of their tax bill as a result of that tax cut. Families with children at home or dependents at home are gonna be able to take the most generous 
tax credit in the country. That's important. That's real savings to families. You know, 70% of what we did through that tax cut is going to seniors and families, you know, people with kids, people with dependents at home, um, and the like. That's really, really important. The estate Jim. tax change is not going to those people, though. It's going to wealthier. I understand. No, no, you know what? I'll tell you a big a, issue. I'm going to tell you a story about the estate tax, okay? At home uh, on trick or treat, on Hall Halloween, somebody, one of the neighbors comes up to me and says, you know what? We just sold our, and this is in our little, you know, neighborhood in East Arlington. We just sold our mom's house around the corner. And thank you. Because of that estate tax, my brothers and sisters and I, you know, they're probably in their 60s. We're going we're gonna to be able to save sixty, seventy thousand dollars 70000 Thank you, because that's going to help us support our kids. So when I think about estate tax, not only was it right-sizing, bringing us in line. Again, we're one of only 12 states with an estate tax in the entire country. By increasing that threshold from what it was to up to, to uh, $3 million, it allows people like that fellow to see, to, to recognize, you know, the savings. It also, you know, is, you know, there, there's a, I'm proud of that. I'm glad you brought up the tax cuts because that, I think that was one of the, the most significant accomplishments. It's, a, it's a, something I ran on, I promised, we delivered on. It's making life more affordable for people in our state and making our state more competitive and equitable. Before we get to the calls, what else would you say is in the top three or four things that you feel you accomplished that you feel really good about in year one? School meals. You know, as of today, no bless you. Thank you. No parent in the state has to worry about how they're going to pay for breakfast or lunch during the school week for their kids. That's a big deal. Uh, community college, making it free to those 25 and older, lowering the cost of in-state uh, tuition uh, for, for residents here at our state colleges and university, appointing the country's first climate chief and, you know, making significant investments um, in workforce, in education, uh, expanding access to mental health services. These are just some of the things. The reason I was late, you know, I came in <laughs> a few minutes late. Thank you for filibustering around We're good at whatever, whatever you're doing yeah, around Jim the primary. Really good. <laughs> um, but, you know, I was just, I was just with a, a fellow at the State House, and uh, he's 41 years old, and he was coming for a recovery event, and he's coming from North Adams. I grew up here uh, in Hyde Park, and... When he graduated from high school, it was 9-11, and he enlisted in the Marines. He was injured. He got addicted to opioids as a result of that injury. He next spent the next 20 years in, in hell and in a variety of programs. And he said, I wanted to thank you because I'm in a successful program now. I'm doing great. And because of your program, Mass Reconnect, Free Community College to those 25, I am going to... Berkshire Community College, I'm studying STEM and 3D printing, and I'm on the road to, to the kind of job that I want. Th that's a story representative of some of what we were able to do this year. Um, I think our response to farmers, frankly, you know, remember the devastating flooding around this state. We rallied, I appointed the first rural affairs director ever. We had our new commissioner of agriculture who happens to be from a farming family in Western Mass on the ground. We quickly were able to work with the legislature, get $20 million in relief to help those farmers um, survive. We were able to reach out to private philanthropy and create a fund, $3 million, that also went to farmers. You know, it's another example of success, I believe, because it shows, you know, the ways in which we can come together as a state. What's your biggest a disappointment from year one? What didn't you get? that was high on your priority list, Governor Healy? Um, you know, you, you always want to see more uh, done uh, more quickly, right? I mean, that's, that's just kind of the inherent nature of the job. And I think that both the LG and our teams bring to this uh, a real urgency around getting stuff done as quickly as possible. But, you know, I'm just grateful to the teams across the administration. I'm grateful to the partnership with the legislature. And I'm grateful to the way that so many people stepped up around the state over the last year. Uh, do we have our challenges? Absolutely. And, you know, the, the biggest challenge we face is housing, the lack of, of housing. We need to make housing more affordable to first-time homebuyers, to renters, to seniors. Uh, it's why I filed the $4 billion housing bill that I did, the Affordable Homes Act. And that's something I'm going to be laser-focused on this year because I don't want housing to, to be the problem that it is right now in our state. Our state is a great state if you can afford to live here. Can I ask one question about housing and then you'll take over? Is that okay? Sure. Since you brought it up, there are two tough nuts to crack, I would argue, for this legislature. Is one, this real estate transfer tax on higher-end transactions, 
which obviously go to affordable housing. It sort of mirrors with a different uh, ceiling what uh, Mayor Wu did in a home rule petition. And also this uh, 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 statewide legislation that would override local zoning rules around those granny flats or whatever the hell they're called, accessory dwelling units, mm -hmm. those sort of ADUs. things, which means they have to stand up to local officials, sort of like the legislature for once did it on this uh, zoning thing, uh, you know, around the T-stops. What are your conversations like with leaders on those two issues? Well, I think everybody recognizes how dominant housing is as an issue here in the state. And, you know, I want people coming here. I want people going to school here and staying here. I want people growing businesses here. I want employers expanding here. And I want people who were born and raised here to be able to stay here. And that's why we need to do all we can to create more housing out there. So the conversations have been positive. Um, and, you know, I'm ready to, to, to work uh, with anyone on this issue. I think that the legislature understands that because, you know, they, we're all hearing from people, right? And they're certainly hearing from constituents. What we laid out in that $4 billion bond bill um, are a number of ways that we can get there. The ADUs are an example. You know, ADUs have been in place by right in other states around the country, and it's a very quick way to create a whole bunch more housing around the state. It makes a lot of sense. So, you know, it's just one of any number of ways to get there. Um, but we must get there for the, for the economic well-being of the state, for the direction of the state. Uh, we, we've slowed, finally, out-migration, um, but we need, to, you know, we need to just continue to keep working on this, and it's the top priority. It's also, Jim, why, you know, when I started, we said that we were going to deliver a housing secretary, um, and we have, for the first time in our state's history, a secretary of housing and livable communities. And from day one, when he started in March, he has been all about, you know, uh, generating, finding ways to generate more housing, um, and the Affordable Homes Act is, is the result of that. We're talking with Governor uh, Maura Healy. She's here until the top of the hour to take your calls and our questions and your questions, 877-301-897. Now let's go to Daisy in Dorchester. Thank you for calling. Hi, Daisy. Hi there. Hi. Um, my question for the governor um, relates to the budget cuts um, and also the fact that Today's news is filled with um, the official count that 2023 was the hottest year in 125,000 years. Um, and I'm also aware that the Commonwealth released a report that it's not on track to meet our own climate goals. So my question is for the governor, um, how are you thinking about the fact that ratepayer money goes to utilities to finance new fossil fuel pipelines and compressor stations while there's also um, uh, an underway expansion of the private jet airport at Hanscom, which would pro uh, provide flights for the ultra-rich, subsidized by the public, and with this expansion canceling out the progress that the Commonwealth has already made towards decarbonization using taxpayer money. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy. Well, um, Daisy, thanks so much for the call, and, you know, uh, one of the areas I think we've made a lot of progress on is, uh, is climate here in the state. I promised and delivered the country's first ever climate chief, Melissa Hoffer. She sits atop all agencies and secretariats, making sure that we are driving uh, everything we need to do to achieve our climate goals, uh, whether it's in transportation or in housing or in infrastructure or even in education, health, and human services. That's the, that's the first thing. You also saw this year an investment, in, a historic investment in programs that go towards resilience, that, that deal with the problems that we are facing right now that are going to manifest, by the way, in 24 hours as we see a storm with more potential flooding, with more potential blown culverts and dams and bridges. We've got to, in this state, make these investments that, uh, in infrastructure to build forward in a more resilient and more sustainable way, and, and we are leading on that. Uh, it's also the case that I made, hard to, made a, a real effort to chase every single federal dollar out there because we can do what, what we can do through what was a $56 billion budget this year, $55 billion budget this year, but Joe Biden has made available for climate unbelievable amounts of money, a trillion dollars available to municipalities and states for climate and infrastructure, the things that Daisy is concerned about. What I did is set up an office of federal funds and infrastructure 
to make sure that we were applying for every single dollar that we could get our hands on. And to date, this year alone, we brought back $2 billion to the state, including much of that to go towards infrastructure. It's hard work, it's absolutely necessary work as we make the necessary transition away from fossil fuels. It's also why I went big. Um, the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest bid ever for offshore wind, 3,600 megawatts. You know, We know that um, there have been struggles right now with some of the pricing there, but I'm standing by it. This is where we need to go as a commonwealth. This is where we need to go as a country. And I think next, you know, next week or the week after when you see our budget for fiscal year 25, you will see continued historic investments in all that we need to do to address uh, climate. By the way, Daisy the president asked, of Vineyard Wind is going to be with us on Friday with Mayor Kurt Atone, who's now running a climate trade And we group. just, you know, uh, there's a lot happening out there. Folks, we just had the first power delivered to our grid from our offshore wind industry. Mm -hmm. That's something to celebrate. It happened here in the holiday season. It was, didn't get as much attention probably as it otherwise would. But just like pause for a second, that's really cool, really important. And what our job is, is to, to do all that we can to scale that up and increase that volume as, as quickly as possible. Governor Daisy also asked about expanding Hanscom Field for private planes, which are terrible p polluters. Um, do you favor that? It's currently before review in one of our agencies, so I'm not going to comment until I see the report. But I guess, I mean, I don't know how it seems so opposite to everything we're trying to do here. You don't want to comment on it one way or the other? It really, given that where it is, the posture of the agency, it's, it's better for me not to. Um, as I've said and just said a minute ago, you know, I support all we need to do to make sure that we're moving away from fossil fuels, yeah. which is why I've leaned into wind. It's why I asked our team to deliver a report on solar. Where are the spots in the Commonwealth that are ripe for solar, whether it's on top of municipal buildings or, you know, other areas of land? Um, you know, we've got to do all we can. It's why we set up for the first time in um, in-state government uh, a team that is working with other New England states and, in fact, uh, with states up and down the Mid-Atlantic because our climate uh, the responsibility, what we need to do in this space, particularly when it comes to, you know, setting up these other non-fossil fuel related energy sources and also making sure that we have the infrastructure in a grid to deliver that to people's homes and businesses requires that states actually collaborate and work together. And I'm really proud of the team for having the foresight and Massachusetts is in the lead on this as convener and organizer of all the New England and Mid-Atlantic states on how we together work to deliver more non-fossil fuel uh, energy uh, power. One last question on this. What's the entity that's going to make the Hanscom decision? What's it, what's it called? Who it's with, it? oh, it's, it's currently is part of our MEPA process within our and Department why would of you Environmental not, Protection. Why would you not want the public to know and them to know what the governor's position is on this critical issue that's before him? Because I respect the work of my teams. Okay. Uh, 877 well, just, I don't mean to obsess over this, but I just can't see how there could possibly be any justification at all. Well, let's let them do their job and, okay. and make their ruling and their decision. Okay. Where are we going next? 877 well, just, Before we go back to the cause, um, coronavirus levels are going up Yikes. Um, in Boston wastewater, and there seems to be a resurgence of, of the virus. Is there anything particular that um, we should know about that from your angle as the governor? I mean, Robbie Goldstein has done a terrific job as our commissioner of the Department of Public Health. I would just encourage people, you know, to get their vaccine, to get their boosters. Uh, there are flu shots, there are shots for RSV. You know, avail yourself and, and, and your family of those, of those resources. Kendra and Mary Mack, thank you for calling. You're on with the governor. Hi, thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you, Governor, for the high priority your administration has placed on addressing the climate crisis. And I have two questions, quickly. One, when will rebates from the Inflation Reduction Act be available to Massachusetts residents to help electrify their homes, as these require states to set up programs to implement them? And two, are there any plans to clearly communicate to residents all of the money available to elect for electric electrification of their homes from both the federal and the state because the number of options is really confusing to people. Thank you. You Thank know, you. Kendra, I am so glad you mentioned that. I had the same conversation with my team the other day, and it was basically like, let's make sure that we're serving up a menu to folks about like what is available and what can they do. Because, you know, this is an area where I think climate 
it can be really overwhelming. You know, when you can, you, there's some, you can just sort of throw your hands up in the air. Like, how can I begin to make a difference in this space? The fact is we all have agency. We can make a difference in our households and how we live our lives. And so Kendra, you'll see soon uh, more about that. And specifically, I'm gonna hold on the, I, I need a, a, a lifeline here. Um, somebody call and find out when, the, the, Kendra's question about the rebates for the Inflation Reduction Act, when, when folks can start seeing that. Um, the governor they, is talking to one of her colleagues, her staff people, by the way. <laughs> people are wondering at home, what is oh, she doing? Oh, just a here? random lifeline yeah. to the ether? No, <laughs> to no whoever, there's actually right? a person here who's going to call <laughs> DOER. And maybe Kendra will, will get you an answer for, before the end of the program. Hey, Kendra, actually, do you want Kendra to take our numbers? So if we don't, That's even better. Kendra, we'll take your numbers, no. so if we don't have an answer by 1 o'clock, the this governor's office This reminds me of ask the AG. Remember, I had to get all those questions, and I'd be <laughs> I like, do remember can you please yeah. stay on the line and take your yeah. number? I think I remember that. <laughs> exactly. Kendra, stay to, stick around, and we'll take your contact information. Thank you much for the call. 877-301-8970. You want to do the audience there, Marjorie? Sure. We, we have, have Eric. a gentleman there. Yep. Eric has a question about highway deaths. Is that correct? Where are you, Eric? Uh, while Eric is moving, we're going to take another call. Elaine in Lexington. Hello, Elaine. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, Marjorie and Jim. You Good too. afternoon, Elaine. I'm calling um, because I'm struggling with affordability on my long-term care insurance premium. Um, since, 19, since 2020, that premium has increased 100%. In 2023, I received a bill with a $2,000 increase on the premium due in 30 days. No advance notice. I'd like to know if there's someone I can speak to at the um, governor's office or what actions I can take. I just can't believe that um, this increase is, is condoned, especially without notice. Yes. Um, Elaine, let, me, let us t take your number, and I'll make sure that we talk to, to folks on the team to see if there's any, anything we can do about that. I, I'm really mindful... Um, of, of people's increased costs and certainly, you know, healthcare uh, in that space generally and care in the space, we've, we've seen exponential growth um, and we've got to try to get a handle on it. Uh, Elaine, do not go away. We're going to get your contact information and share with the governor's office too, and they'll be in touch with you. And now we're going to speak with Eric, who's at the Boston Public Library microphone. Hi, Eric. Thanks Hi, for Eric. joining Hi. us. Hi, thanks for having me. Sure. <clears throat> My name is uh, Eric Shivian. I've been a practicing physician in the Commonwealth for more than 50 years. Uh, I greatly admire you, Governor Healy, uh, particularly for appointing the spectacular Melissa Hopper as climate czar. Thanks, Eric. I have a comment and a question. Is, is this feedback? No, it's working. It's working, okay. We're good. Uh, every week, I... Can you hear? Oh, she yes. Can yeah. <laughs> and I can see you. I want, I want you to hear. Uh, every week I drive 140 miles to central Massachusetts and back on Route 2. Almost all of the cars and trucks are going over 70 miles per hour. About half are going over 80 and many over 85 and 90 miles per hour. Two-ton assault weapons, often separated by only a few feet from each other, some passing each other at high speed on the right and also on the left. I almost never see a state trooper anywhere. And when I do, he or she generally does nothing about the speeding. 2022 was the second consecutive record year for traffic deaths in Massachusetts. 430 people were killed. I expect 2023 will break that record. I've worked for many years in emergency rooms, and all it takes is to see one dead, mangled child from a car crash, and I have seen many, to know that this lawless driving on state roads cannot, must not, be allowed to continue. Doctor, we need a question. My Here apologies. It comes. Here it is. Here Thank it you. Comes. Thank you kindly. My question, Governor Healy, is what are you doing and what are you planning to do about this unacceptable threat to our lives, a threat that can be massively reduced simply by enforcing speeding laws, at the same time massively increasing state revenues? Thank you. Thanks for your question. Um, 
Where do you practice in Central Mass? I don't practice in Central Mass. I practice in Boston. I have a farm in Petersham, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. quite near Melissa Hoffer's goat farm. That's right. <laughs> no, it's, a, uh, <laughs> it's a beautiful. That's a beautiful. That's where we're supposed to bring spot. the Christmas trees, I guess, that's for correct. the goats to eat them. Yeah. Um, well, let me take that back, Eric, and talk to our executive office of public safety. I mean, we saw through COVID an increase, I think, nationally um, coming out and during that time and. Uh, in fatalities, it's, it's, it's a national issue, so let me take that back. I know one of the things we're thinking about is enforcement and the use of technology around enforcement, so it's not just personnel um, on the roads, but actually technology as well. So I appreciate, I appreciate the comment, and um, thank you for what you do and caring for people, and I can imagine how, uh, how horrible it is to, to, to bear witness to that. And, you know, um, people's recklessness or... or disregard for others and the lives of, of others, um, it's, it's a point worth reminding us all about. Doctor, if you leave your contact information yeah, with please, Hannah, our coworker, do. the governor, we'll give it to the governor's office. Thank you for coming. Please do. Can we stay in Thank transportation you. for a minute? Uh, I'm going to preempt you saying how impressed you are with Philip Eng so far, because we are too. Very. Okay, and we know you are. We've read you say it, but obviously Philip Eng is the new head of the T. Ted Lasso. We discussed, well, he was kind enough to take calls, by the way, which was really great, uh, unlike his predecessors who hit out historically, but that's our opinion, not yours. Uh, we talked to him about the uh, narrow uh, tracks on the green line and how the, virtually the whole line has got to be expanded to deal with slowness and safety and that sort of thing. We also raised the name of the man, this Dalton guy, who was in charge of the green line expansion when all this was happening, and he focused he wouldn't, didn't really want to talk about accountability there, and I don't mean this in a pejorative way, I'm just trying to be descriptive. He said, we want to get this fixed that we're not going to have the rate pay, the uh, fair payers or the taxpayers pay anymore. I know you've made the same assurance. If someone like Dalton, who at least based on Globe coverage, covered up this situation and potentially put people at risk financially and in terms of their health, is not held accountable, why is there an incentive for another Mr. Dalton to not do the same kind of thing when serving state government, Governor? Yeah, I think that people... Um Understand, you know, and I want taxpayers and residents to know, I mean, everybody is expected to do their job, to do their job well, uh, certainly competently. There's a review ongoing as to what happened there, okay? So I'm going to let that proceed, and whatever actions need to be taken will be taken. I have said, though, that when it comes to the contractor in this particular engagement on, on GLX, on the Green Line extension, that I don't want to see a dime of taxpayer money having, go, having to go to rectify the situation. So we'll, we'll see where their review lands. But, you know, I am focused, Jim, as I think I need to be, on the now. What are we doing now to make things uh, move faster and assure the public that the, the, the public transit is, is safe and reliable. Are we entitled to know why Dalton decided not to disclose this allegedly to Governor Baker think, uh, and the public? I, well, I think that that review is ongoing and all that information will be made available. And I'm not uh, crediting <laughs> it, what, what you're presupposing in your, in your comment either. I'm just telling you that, of course, I'm going to make everything available. But it is factually accurate that he didn't disclose to anybody, as far as we know, including the governor, according to the yeah, governor's spokesperson. I mean, it, it appears to the be that way. The tracks were too narrow. It appears to be that way, but, like, you know, nobody was, nobody was more pissed off than I was when I learned this, because we have had to clean up one thing after another when it comes to the T. That is why I'm thrilled that GM Ng is on the job. I'm thrilled that we hired 1,400 new T workers. I'm thrilled, by the way, anybody coming from the North Shore, you know, Filling the T, our T delivered on a promise, which was, you know, a year ago, people were told that people in Lynn weren't going to see a commuter rail stop for another two years. Phil Ang comes on the job. I said to him, how quickly can you get this built? He said December. He opened ahead of time. So now the good news is people come from, from that area don't have to take a bus, don't have to drive it up to Swampscott to, to then get on a, a train to come in. They can get on right in Lynn, which will shave an hour off a commute. So, you know, we're making progress. The whole shutdown right now, we're here, uh, in back, we're here in Back Bay. Green line right now, according to the plan that we set forward, which is to eliminate all slow zones in less than a year, green line is shut down right now. So buses are going between North Station and, and, and Fenway, I believe. You know, it's just like these are the things we need to do 
to, to systematically reduce the slow zones. We're down to about 16% uh, right now. We continue to make progress. I'm going to continue to, to work with the team, push the team, um, and that's, that's what we need to do. One last transportation question. When you were elected governor, the first conversation we had with you was about transparency and how this state is the least transparent in terms of public records of any state in America, which is a fact. That's not an opinion. We talked to you a couple of months ago about the former Secretary of Transportation leaving and the public not really knowing. You said to us that it was mutual. This is fee and DACA. BUR is reporting there was a non-disclosure agreement where she can't criticize you, the government, and you can't criticize her. How does that serve the public when a critical public official leaves and an agreement has been signed that precludes us from knowing anything that might be of value to us about her That's tenure what it leaving. Says. What That's does what it, it say? Says. It's a non-disparagement, I believe. But well, non-disparagement, yeah, I'm it's, sorry. It's different. And, folks, I not only did um, we disclose that agreement, uh, we've answered all the questions about I it. I meant the non-disparagement. Yeah, My apologies. Well, those are different. And, uh, you know, when it comes to, to the Department of Transportation, I uh, am impressed and, and pleased with, with the leadership team there, and we're just going to continue to move forward, making sure that we're doing all we can to deliver public transit in the state that is safe and reliable, and also that we're making the investments that we need to make in transportation generally across the state. And by the way, we're not just talking about Boston or Greater Boston. You know, I mentioned that federal funds program. One of the things that we chased and got was $100 million for important rail investments that are going to help enable East-West Rail, right? These are the things we need to be doing. Investments in our regional transit authorities so that people in central and western Massachusetts and the Cape are able to get about more easily, you know, to the, to the store, to doctor's appointments and the like. So this has been a big focus. Look, we introduced water transit for the first time, right? And uh, more investments need to be made there. So I'm really excited about the new energy, the new innovation at our Department of, of Transportation. It, it's what the public deserves and it's, it's what you're going to get. Governor, one last thing about the teeth. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marge Regan. Much more importantly, this hour, the governor is with us for her monthly Ask the Governor. She's with us till a little bit after 1 o'clock. You can contact her at 877-301-8970, either by call or text, or you can come to the mic at the studio, as Lynn did, from Moms Demand Action. Didn't you tell us your first meeting as governor was with Moms Demand Action? Isn't that true? You can say yes. I, <laughs> I'm just going back. My, uh, that may well be. And also, I mean, my relationship with Moms Demand Action goes way, way back to the time I was not Attorney General but was in the Attorney General's office. So. Great. Hi, Lynn. Hi. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you it's for your first It's always great year. to see the red shirts. Yes, yeah. yes. And we keep changing them up a little bit. So, um, but thank you for your first year in service. I was at your um, swearing-in last year. So um, I have a question, but I also wanted to just remind everybody that we have a gun sense bill um, up at the State House, and the, um, the House passed a bill in November, and the Senate is now planning to do their own version. And um, we know we have your support, but we'd like to hear what you have to say about where it is, and I want to be there when you sign the bill. <laughs> Well, thank you, and thank you for being here. Um, we're taking a look at that, and we'll talk with, you know, we'll continue to talk with uh, members of the legislature about the legislation. And as you know, I've been uh, a strong supporter of important um, gun safety laws and, and reforms there. So we have two um, events coming up uh, tomorrow. We have something at the Rosendale Public Library for uh, those that want to join Moms Demand. I'm making a shameless plug here. And the month of January is for um, National Survivor Awareness uh, Week, and we have an event um, in uh, Saturday, January 27th. So if you want, want to text READY to 64433, you can get some information on uh, Mom's Demand. Well done, Lynn. It's nice to see yeah. you. Thanks so much Thanks for being again here. Thanks for nice taking to see my you. question. Yeah, good luck. You Thank know, you. Governor Healy, this isn't really about your job, but I'm, I'm really curious what you think. You were a big standout of the basketball team at Harvard University. We just had the, and you're the first woman governor of Massachusetts. We just had the first woman, well, not the first woman, second woman, uh, but the first woman of color, president of Harvard University, Claudine Gay, uh, that stepped down. What did you think? Well, I was disappointed to see her step down. Um, I was disappointed in the process. I was disappointed in the whole way all of this unfolded. And, you know, I also just, just will say that we've got to realize and recognize the broader context of what's happening here. Um, several weeks ago, Elise Stefanik convened a hearing, and it was interesting. She, 
she called three people, all of whom happened to be women, uh, one woman of color, and had them for the hearing. We could talk about the hearing. I think that Claudine Gay and the other presidents have uh, rightly apologized for some of the comments that they made that were uh, very lawyerly in, in a response and really missed the moment in terms of you know where we need to be because it's absolutely clear we need to denounce genocide and denounce anti-Semitism and denounce Islamophobia and we need to make sure that students are safe on campus, right? That's one thing, but you know, I, I, here's, here's what's happening right now. Um, at least Stefanik has continued, right? Because this wasn't, I mean, this, there is a, a systematic effort right now um, by some on the far right to go after higher education right now. And that's, what's, that's what you see playing out with the calls to defund higher education, uh, to eliminate some of the programming, uh, to eliminate uh, pilot, for example. This is a problem because, you know, we have to be strong about our academic institutions and it, to have, you know, the hypocrisy of Elise Stefanik, right, who openly praised a candidate who has praised Hitler. I mean, give me a break. Referred to the January 6th insurrectionists as, as, as hostages, uh, someone who's an election denier. I mean, the idea that the likes of someone like Elise Stefanik is going to call into question, you know, um, higher education, or the value of higher education in this country really galls me. So, you know, that's, that's my comment and, and also, you know, a warning um, in terms of what's happening out there and, and what's at play. Do you think she had to go, uh, the, that the performance in Congress coupled with the accusations of plagiarism, do you think she had to go? Yeah, I think that Claudine Gay addressed those. I thought that, that uh, the corporation had addressed those. I thought she could continue to leave the university. 877-301-8970. Rama, you're on uh, Boston Public Radio with the Governor of the Commonwealth. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hello. And, uh, hey, thanks. I was uh, listening to the program, I believe, a month or two ago, and when you asked the Governor that question about Hanscom expansion, she said the same exact words, if I'm not mistaken. Now, uh, those agencies that are in their process Aren't those agencies our agencies? And why is that process not transparent? Can I go to those meetings? Can you go to those meetings, Jim, Marjorie? Uh, I think talk about lawyerly political speak. I just wish, wish our governor would please stop dancing. Well, what's a, how about a question? What's this, what's uh, rather than a saying? speech, how about a what's question? This, what's this person's name? Yeah, uh, Rama. Rama. The question, what is, the question is, can I? Okay. Rama, Rama hey, Rama. Let, let me cut to it, Rama. Let the okay? governor respond. Um, <laughs> First of all, there is a process. There's a process for comment. There's a process for submission by the various parties. I ask you to familiarize yourself with the MEPA process. No one's trying to hide the ball on anything. Um, the teams that do this work are thoughtful. Uh, they're engaged, and nobody's hiding anything. And it does take a little bit of time to do things the right way and to make sure that everybody's heard. Ramah, thank you for the call. Governor, there's some uh, decision was made by your administration, not decision, but announcement about financial aid applications for undocumented students in higher ed. Could you fill people in briefly on what that is, please? Yeah, you know, you asked about different things we did this year. And, um, you know, one of the things we did this year, Jim, in-state tuition yeah. for students who are undocumented. We've got a lot of kids who, you know, may have come to this country when they were two or three or four years old. This is the only country, the only state they've ever known. And they've done everything right. But when they get to, you know, graduate from high school, they find out, wow, I'm not treated like my friends. I can't qualify for in-state tuition. I can't get a driver's license. You know, I can't get financial aid or scholarships come through the state. We just changed all that in the state, and we should be proud of that, okay? We now have driver's licenses for folks who are undocumented, who are contributing in so many different ways to our Commonwealth. We now have in-state tuition available to residents who are un students who are undocumented. And uh, we also now have financial aid through the state available to all students, okay, who are documented, who are undocumented. This is good. Right? Don't we want everybody who's living here, we want to invest in them so they become part of our, you know, our workforce and, and, and our economy and you know, we're able to, to further their, uh, their opportunity. So I'm really pumped about this. The program is, uh, is uh, available. I'll get you where folks can go, but know that if you are a student right now, you're eligible to go and uh, go online and apply uh, for our 
MASA program um, that'll make you, you know, eligible to receive state scholarships, state funding, the same as any other student in the state. You're, you're, I assume you're looking and we'll get a web address in the next few minutes from you or one of your colleagues, or where do they go? It's mass, mass.edu slash MASFA, M-A-S-F-A. Fair enough. Governor, what's happening with the migrant crisis? I know some people have been able to get work permits, which is a big deal, but there still is a real um, emergency here. You know, there is, and this is one of the things that um, was happening a little bit, you know, last year, but really, really picked up this year, and it's been a challenge. It's been a challenge for me as governor. It's been a challenge for governors around the country. Um, the geopolitical forces that have uh, resulted in unprecedented waves of folks coming across the border from Central and South America, um, often originating in other places. The folks we see here in Massachusetts who've come, uh, probably 80% have been Haitian. You know, people are fleeing the most desperate of circumstances, and they're doing so at great risk to their lives um, and their kids, but they're doing it because they are so desperate. I've been trying to manage it as best as I can, and I will say that I am uh, really proud of the people in Massachusetts and the communities who've stepped up. We um, were able to recently, let me, let me just level set, we've got about 7,500 families right now in um, what is called emergency shelter. Uh, half of those families are, we know are migrant families. Um, we were able to recently, I reached out to the Biden administration, I asked them to send people on the ground here from the Department of Homeland Security to help us complete and expedite work permits because everybody who's come wants to work. And as of today, we've uh, been able to get about 3,000 work authorizations for people who've come here, which will enable them to work, and that's all they want to do. I continue to call on Congress to pass. I continue to call... I continue to call on Congress to pass President Biden's supplemental budget, which will make some needed changes to the asylum process, provide funding to interior states like Massachusetts and New York and Illinois, who are bearing a lot of the burden right now of migrant arrivals, and make some necessary changes at the border when it comes to the enforcement of, of fentanyl trafficking and just more resources for support at the border. That needs to happen. And it, by the way, it is <laughs> really rich to hear uh, some uh, Republicans in Congress rail against this and, and look to exploit it right now. You see what's happening out there in the, in, the, in the discourse when they are refusing to sign that budget request which will address this issue. You know, Governor, you mentioned a minute ago, uh, we are, I, I don't think this is a surprise, or we're fairly critical, Marjorie and I, of the speed with which the legislature addresses critical issues. You obviously have a different kind of relationship. You mentioned undocumented students and in-state tuition. I may be off by one or two. I think roughly half the states had passed that law before we did. We talked the other day about those fentanyl strips. 36 states did it before we did. We talked about uh, revenge porn, as in the paper today, is something the legislature is going to take. I believe 48 states have done it, and we still have yet to do it. Are you troubled? We're allegedly the most progressive state in America. Are you troubled by the, 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 at least what I characterize as the lack of urgency this legislature shows on so many issues? Yeah, you know, like I say, we, we, got done, we got done this year some pretty significant things. Uh, the tax cuts, billion dollars in tax cuts hasn't happened in over 20 years. The historic investments that we made in education, both K through 12 and higher ed, the investments that we made in workforce and childcare, which we're going to build upon in next year's budget. And, you know, things like, th there are bills that I've been able to sign that I have long supported, um, but, you know, they, they, weren't, uh, they weren't able to get done, and they got done this year. And I'm proud of that, and I'm grateful to the legislature who, you know, was supporting many of these things. No-cost calls for people who are incarcerated. The in-state tuition that you mentioned. Driver's licenses for those who are undocumented. I mean, these are things that were supported within the legislature. But, you know, as governor, it's, I had the opportunity to say, lend my support and sign it and, you know, make sure we get it done. But like and, guns, and when mom's demand so, action was here, the gun bill uh, didn't happen because of a childish disagreement 
about committee jurisdiction on an issue that I know from having talked to you ad nauseum about this as Attorney General is one of the most, gun safety, one of the most important issues to you. How is that serving the public? Again, I just look at the, the, the last year and my role as, as governor, which has been to support and advocate for legislation, to work with the legislature on legislation. You know, I'm really proud of, of what has been uh, a series of, of really great things that we got done. And I'm going to continue, Jim, to work every day. I mean, I bring, uh, I, and the team does, a lot of, like, energy and intentionality and, and importantly for residents, urgency around getting things done. And, you know, I, again, I'm really, uh, I'm really pleased with what we were able to get done this year. Uh, and when I say we, I mean our administration and the legislature, and they deserve credit for that. And then, you know, there are some other things that we're just able to do. Um, you know, I think about clemency, you know, in terms of accomplishments. To be able to, as governor, um, issue the, the, the pardons that I issued early on. I mean, you know, we're able More to More than just... any first-year governor since Dukakis. We've talked yeah. about this on the air. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, there's... There's a, there's a lot of work, and, and I'm grateful to the teams in our administration. I'm grateful to the partners in government, across government, um, including a lot at the local level. And, you know, that includes the private sector, too. I mean, we are in this together. And when I look back on one of the big wins for the state this year, ARPA-H. We were named by the Biden administration an ARPA-H, uh, a hub for, for the country. And that's going to bring a whole bunch of resources, financial, personnel, and otherwise, that uh, are going to help Massachusetts be the leader uh, in the incubator for all the new break for, for new breakthroughs that are going to happen when it comes to medicine and health and and, and the like and that that happened because we basically uh, worked as a team to, to quarterback an effort with private industry uh, with investors with our academic teaching hospitals with our universities um, and with government to submit an application that was recognized you know, for being fantastic and got us the award. That's a big deal, right? So, you know, we talk a lot about Team Massachusetts and partnership, and I think that's what this year has been about. You know, everybody's got to contribute uh, from all different sectors, all different realms, and that's how we're going to be able to get things done. And, you know, I, I, Governor, I, I look at the text messages, and sometimes I miss things what you were, you were doing it, but I don't know if you mentioned the bill you're filing about modernizing st the IT system and state government, because a couple of texters have asked if this means that would there be, if there were to be another crisis with vaccinations or anything like there was a few years ago during COVID, they wouldn't have to hire an 18-year-old to come in <laughs> and, and <laughs> figure, out, yeah, figure out the, <laughs> the system so they know when to show up at Gillette for their, for their vaccines. So did you talk about the IT system? Yes. Okay. Uh, no, not here. She didn't. Okay. No, we, we, uh, great, great new secretary uh, there in, in, in the department who today uh, filed a, what we call the Future Tech Act. It, it's, a, it's a more than billion dollar plan to basically modernize our IT systems. And, you know, at the end of the day, IT is the backbone of everything. You know, every service that we deliver, every interface with residents, with municipalities, with business. And as Massachusetts, like we better have the very best technology of all states in the country, right? Like so much of it was pioneered here, developed here. You know, we have got to be the best. And that's why we filed this bill today. It's a bond bill that enables us to go out and borrow some more money to make the investments that we need to make now to modernize our technology system so that, you know, whether it's the next, I, I don't, <laughs> certainly for the next crisis, but more than that, for everyday use. RMV, all those every, places, yep. Yeah, everyday use. We've got to make sure that it's really top shelf and that there's a, uh, uh, an ease of, of use for, for residents, for our businesses, for municipalities. That's what this is about. And we've actually spent a lot of time, and credit to, to Secretary Snyder, for the time that he and his team have spent. You know, it also means helping out our municipalities, who in this day and age are subject to cybersecurity you know, issues, right, and cyber attacks. You've had towns and cities held hostage by ransom attacks. Um, we've got to make sure that everybody's shored up, our state agencies as well as our municipalities. And our administration, and, you know, credit to Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll, who knows a thing or two about municipal government, uh, we've really leaned hard into investing in and partnering with and supporting our municipalities. And, and uh, that's also reflected in the Future Tech Act. The other thing that we leaned into with this Future Tech Act is making the portable, portal for child care oh, easier to use. Child care, one of the greatest stressors facing families in the state. 
We know we have high costs for childcare. We're working on lowering the costs of access to childcare through our budget last year and the one that we're going to file. And we want to better um, operationalize that, make it easier to use, make it easier for people to access uh, uh, child care and navigate, uh, including financial assistance um, for child care. And we're going to do that through, through this Future Tech Act. We have Lorraine at the Boston Public Library microphone. Uh, is she still there? The other Lorraine? thing I'd say about that, because we're sitting here in the heart of everything, AI. You know, AI yeah. obviously is a game changer. We want to be a state that leads when it comes to the application of AI and how we can use AI in a way that's constructive and useful uh, to, to make life better for folks. Well, uh, Lorraine is getting to the mic. Anna, you're in Rockport. You're on with Governor Maura Healy. Welcome. Yes, hi. Uh, thanks for having me on today. Sure, sure. Um, I wanted to ask the governor if she had a chance to read the articles in the Boston Globe by Liz Kowalczyk about the abuse and mistreatment mm -hmm. of people with autism and intellectual and developmental disabilities and what she intends as governor to do about that. My son was uh, abused in a group home in 2017, and since then, I have testified at the state legislature, met with um, Governor Healy's office when she was attorney general, um, worked on getting legislation passed, but yet the numbers of abuse keep going up and up every year. And um, so it, it's really a tragedy in Massachusetts. It's a state shame that this is happening. And I just want to ask the governor what she intends to do about this. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for the call. Uh, I certainly did read the articles. And just more generally, I've spent a lot of time with, with families on this, as well as with folks within our um, health and human services agencies. And there are many agencies that, that touch this. Um, you know, I want to say at the outset, my heart goes out to you and to so many families, um, parents, caregivers, uh, who are struggling with this and dealing with this. Um, and as a state, we have to do everything that we can to make sure that the right resources are in place. Um, as Anna knows, as most people know, we have a real workforce issue, uh, workforce shortages. So how do we, you know, do things like get uh, people through programs, including, you know, making sure community college is free. Um, so that we have more of a workforce there? How do we recruit people in? We have to pay people more. I mean, that's why we increased the rates in the last budget. And, you know, we'll look to build on that because we need people in these spaces. And certainly, you know, and I can say as governor and, and, and certainly given my prior experience, anyone who abuses uh, anyone in a state uh, facility will be held accountable and will be investigated. But, you know, I think that your lived experience, Anna, uh, is always what should drive the work and the policy decisions of, of government, including all of our agencies. And so, you know, I'm, I'd like to make sure that we follow up with you on it directly so we can hear more about, um, about what happened to your son. And, and I'm very sorry for, uh, for the, the, the abuse he was subjected to. And so are we. Don't go yes. away. Stay Take your information. Phone. You know, speaking of did you read, have you read the piece in the New York Times essentially outing Taylor Swift? Uh, did you read this thing by Anna Marks? Have you heard about it? I didn't read it. I read about it. What do you think about it? I think it's silly. I think it's stupid. I don't know. I don't know why people write this kind of stuff. I love Taylor Swift, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, she's just unbelievable. Didn't really out Taylor Swift. It, well, it, it debated to. whether or not she was straight or gay. And um, it was, I thought it was odd that the New York Times published it, frankly. I thought it was yeah, pretty irresponsible. I thought there's a lot of stuff to write about. Yeah. Um, write it, you know, but what a... Um, she really is something, and and I. Did you see her? You I, I got see to see her. No, I got to see her this summer, and uh, I mean, what a performer, you know, and what a lyricist. Do you like Bruce Springsteen wrote about her the other day? Commented about like what an incredible lyricist the lyrics, she is. And, yeah, you know, and how she's lasted, and you know, very intergenerational. And there, there are a number of artists that we could, you know, talk about right right now. You raised Taylor Swift, so I just had to say uh, something about. Who that, else can we talk about, about right now? Lighten the conversation. Lighten? Uplift us. Who this else do you want not, to talk? This is not. This is good. Okay, fine. We've good. Got, go. we got Lorraine. Did there. Boston Calling come out yet? Have yeah, announced it came there? out. I'll tell yeah. you in a second. It's in the Globe. Yeah, we'll tell yeah. you. But meanwhile, we'll talk to Lorraine because uh, we called her over to the microphone. So go ahead, okay, Lorraine. What's great. your question? Boston, Hi, Lorraine. You, Boston Calling lineup is great. It's May, right? It's Memorial Day. I don't know what the hell it is. 
is. We're going to check it, right it, now. Jim, oh, it, it is, is okay. Memorial Sorry. Day. Excuse okay, me. it's Fine. great. Boston Calling, great okay. lineup this year. Lorraine, thank you for your patience. Hi. Hi. And Governor Healy, Healy, I so appreciate your leadership. I have two sentences. We have owned a HOP home, Housing Opportunity Program, for 31 years, but cannot sell it for enough to make a lateral move into something smaller now that we're retired. We are both almost 80 years old and want our lovely home to go to a younger family, but can't do that because of the resale cap. Can you help us? Yeah, let's talk more about that, Lorraine, and the specific program. Um, but, you know, more generally speaking, I think, Lorraine, this is what I was trying to talk to people about, you know, earlier on in the program. It's like, we've got 351 cities and towns in this great state. Our destiny as a state in, in within each and in every one of those cities and towns is truly tied to one another. And that's why I'm asking people to get behind and support the Affordable Homes Act. Support that law, which will enable us to make the investments we need to make to make more housing for seniors who want to downsize, for first-time homeowners, if, home buyers who want to own a home, for renters who are desperately looking uh, to, to buy a home. We just need to get that done. And yes, I am asking people to make changes when it comes to zoning practices, when it comes to you know different policy uh, practices. But if we don't do this, we're going to suffer collectively as a state. And we shouldn't suffer as a state. There's a way through this. There's a way out of this. And there's a way that we can help people like you um, and others across the state. And I just, you know, you know this. You, you know every, the, everybody listening, you know, at some point is feeling, you know, directly through their family or people they, they know uh, the real pain points associated with housing costs in this state. And we've got to do everything we can to make housing more available uh, to a range of folks uh, around, around this entire state. It is a, it is a problem um, and something that we collectively need to really take up. Thank you so much. By the way, we but, only have a minute. But stay I'm here, sorry. and I'll send somebody over oh, yeah. to talk to you about your program. Okay? Uh, 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 the, uh, wait a second here. Uh, Boston Calling. Ed Sheeran. Yep. Megan Thee Stallion. Tell the truth. You know who Tyler Childers is? Yes. You do not. Yeah, the country star. Oh, my God. That's right. They're very Governor's impressive. very hip. The Killers, Hozier. I don't know about that. And a couple other people there. Uh, uh, someone just uh, texted us and said we don't have the rebate information yet. Yeah. Will your office get it to us by two and we can say it on the air? Is that doable? Yeah. Um, rebates could come as soon as this year. They depend on the program. We are right now setting up a clearinghouse to centralize everything for consumers like Kendra who called in earlier. Okay? And we'll make sure when we finalize that, we'll get that right over to you for dissemination. I will just say something about the arts. Um, something that, the, that Kim Driscoll and I have talked about and promoted is our creative economy. Um, we know arts are super important to the fabric of community and to who we are as a state. They're also important economic drivers and engines, and so that's why in our budget we made historic investments in the cre creative economy. You're going to see more of that in time to come. So, you know, we want more shows. We want more concerts. We want more artists. We want more open studios. You know, we want, want more gallery showings. We want, you know, more ways to uh, promote arts and culture in, in this great state of ours. So uh, I just wanted to put a plug in for that. Uh, and all the creatives out there, um, as um, as we were talking about some some shows that are going to come Leon Bridges too, who is fabulous. That's great. It's going to be uh, good, Governor. It's a pleasure. Happy New Year. We're really glad to see you. We'll see you next month. Thank you Terrific. so much for being yeah, here, Mariela. Yes, thank you very very Thanks much. For having me.